What does it take to migrate from Jim Crow, Tennessee to Hitsville, Michigan, and successfully provide for a family of five children and an ailing husband? The answer to that question underlies the remarkable story Brigitte Davis tells in her new book, The World According to Fannie Davis, a tribute to her mother, a Jill of all trades bookie, banker, wife, and parent who bucked the 60s and 70s decay of Detroit to lead her family into prosperity. A professor of journalism and the writing prof professions at Baruch College and director of the Sidney Harmon Writer in Residence Program at the City University of New York, Ms. Davis is the author of Into the Glow, Go Slow, the acclaimed story of a young woman traveling from Detroit to Nigeria as she mourns the death of her sister and Shifting Through Neutral, a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. As a recent review in the New York Times explains, one of two, the world according to Fannie Davis is a daughter's gesture of loving defiance, an act of reclamation, an absorbing portrait of her mother in full. Please welcome back Brigitte Davis to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your sort of braving the weather. I'm seeing people I know, so it's really exciting. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the book, but before I do, I just thought I would talk a little bit about, uh, in my mind, probably the biggest motivation for me to write this book. I like thinking about this when I'm in a library because I love libraries. I think most writers do. Um, and I really loved the Detroit Public Library, the main branch. Um, right downtown on Woodward Avenue. When I was growing up, I went there often. It's really a beautiful structure. You walk in and you can hear your footsteps echoing on the marble steps, it's gorgeous. So I used to go there a lot as a child and I went there once. <laughs> um, I was very young, I was probably about 10. And I saw this book that was on display. The book was called, Daddy Was a Number Runner. I saw the title and I was like, oh my God. Something about it just made me nervous. And I, and I'll tell you why in a second. And I grabbed the book and all I could manage to do was open it to the first page and someone named James Baldwin had written a foreword to it. But I didn't read it, I was too nervous. I just closed the book and put it back on the display. And, um, I ran out of the library. I didn't even get books that day as I usually do. I met my sister on the steps and we left and I never told her about this book called Daddy Was a Number Runner. And it's because my mom was a numbers runner too. And I had never seen it publicly stated. I certainly hadn't seen it on the cover of a book. It just, it, it, I was undone by it. I, that's the only way I can explain it is I thought, what? I, I can't make sense of this. So fast forward, literally, maybe two weeks later, I come home and my mom has completely changed my bedroom. This was like her. I got home and she had given me brand new bedroom furniture, new bookshelves and gorgeous like desk with a chair and on the bookshelves, <laughs> was one book, Daddy Was a Number Runner. Oh my God. So obviously I have her permission to read this book and I do, I devour it. And the thing was, I had never in my life read a book that had a little black girl as the main character, never. And I just, I couldn't believe it. Francie was like me. I related to her, I was thrilled. And that moment was so profound for me that um, it never left me. And I think it, it was the moment I decided to become a writer. I think that was the moment my mother was giving me permission to do two things. Yes, to pursue this idea that I could be a writer, but also to one day tell my story. It took me a while, it took me decades, but that's the story. And I really believe she gave me permission to tell it. So anyway, oh yeah, footnote. The author of that book, Louise Merriweather, as fate would have it, 
decades later in New York City, I got to meet her and tell her how this book had changed my life and thrust my original copy that I still owned in her hands. And she looked at it and said, oh my God, I don't even have this copy anymore. And then she wrote in it, dear Bridgette, my daddy was a number runner, your mama was a number runner, and we are soul sisters. Love, Louise. Louise is 95, and every season we go to Red Lobster and have dinner together. Isn't that awesome? I think that's awesome. Anyway, so I'm going to read now. I'm going to start, um, I'm just going to start with the prologues because there's no need for a setup, and it's, I thought I'd read for about 10 or 12 minutes, and then we could chat. Does that sound good? All right, good. I hope you guys have lots of questions. I like questions. Oh, this water's for me. Did you guys know today is pub day? Yes, yes. You're experiencing my publication day with me. I'm very excited. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. On a morning like most, I sit beside Mama at the dining room table, eating my bowl of sugar frosted flakes and watching her work. She's on the telephone, its receiver in the crook of her neck as she records her customers' three digit bets in a spiral notebook, repeating each one. The crystal chandelier blazes above. Five, four, two, four, quarter. Six, nine, three, straight for 50 cents. Is this both races, Miss Queenie? Detroit and Pontiac? Okay. Five, four, two, straight for a quarter. Uh huh. Four, seven, five, straight for 50 cents. One, ten, box for a dollar. Mama writes the numbers. One, one, zero draws a box around them, hesitates. You know, I got customers been playing 110 all week. Yeah, it's a fancy number. Oh, did you? What did you dream? He was a hunchback? Is that what the Red Devil dream books say it play for? Now that I didn't know. I know theater plays for 110. Well, I can take it for a dollar, but since it's a fancy, I can't take it for more than that. You understand. What else, Miss Queenie? Six, eight, four for 50 cents? Uh-huh. Nine, seven, two, straight for a dollar? I find comfort in Mama's voice, in the familiar, rhythmic recitation of numbers. I bring the bowl to my lips and drink the last of the sweetened milk before I rise and kiss Mama's forehead. She mouths bye-bye as I join my sister Rita, who's waiting on the porch. Together, we walk three long blocks to Winterhalter Elementary and Junior High School, passing by the lush Russell Woods Park. I am a first grader. In class, I wait in line to show my teacher, Miss Miller, my assignment. We have had to color paper petals, cut them out and paste them onto a picture of a flower. I like mine. I have glued each one just at the base so that the petals now reach out into a pop-up flower. Miss Miller looks over my work, gives it one star instead of two, and stops me before I can return to my seat. You sure do have a lot of shoes, she says. Last week, she asked what my father did for a living. And because I knew never to disclose the family business, I said, he doesn't work. She asked, well, what does your mother do? I froze. I'm not sure, I lied. I knew my mother was in the numbers, but I also knew not to tell that to anyone. I worried that my vague answer was the wrong one but I didn't know a better response. No one had told me yet what I should say. Now, with Miss Miller staring at me, I look down at my feet, which are clad in, I still remember, 
light blue patent leather slip-ons with lace trimmed buckles. A favorite pair bought to match a brocade ensemble that I have just worn for Easter. I nod, not knowing what else to do. Before you sit down, I want you to name every pair of shoes you have. She insists, go ahead. There is no lightness in her voice. Anxious, I go through a mental inventory of the shoes that line the built-in rack in my bedroom closet. I manage to recall 10 pairs in various colors and styles. The black and white polka dotted ones with a bow tie, the buckled ruby red ones, the salmon pink lace-ups. 10 pairs is an awful lot says Miss Miller. Her blue eyes fix on me with something I cannot name, but which I would now call disdain. And she orders me to take my seat. I can feel my classmates staring at me as I return to my table. Is it wrong to have so many pairs of shoes? Did my mother get them in a bad way? The next day in class, Miss Miller calls me back to her desk. I can smell the hairspray in her teased blonde bouffant. You didn't mention you had white shoes, she snaps. Indeed, I'm wearing a white version of the same pair I wore the previous day. I feel as though I have been caught in a lie, and I know that I have disappointed my teacher. I worry that I'll get in trouble at school or worse, at home. I'm sorry, I whisper. Miss Miller shakes her head in disgust and dismisses me with a wave of her hand. I return to my desk, trying hard not to look down in my shoes. I am ashamed of them. That evening, I tell Mama what happened, but I wait until after she has finished taking her customers' bets and before the day's winning numbers come out. I have already learned that the best time to tell mama difficult news, something that could get you in trouble, is during that brief expected pause in the day. That's when mama's least distracted and still in a good mood. She listens and when I confess, I forgot to tell Miss Miller about the 11th pair of shoes, her dark eyes flash with anger. I fear a spanking. That's none of her damn business, she says. Who does she think she is? Before I can feel relief that she's not mad at me, Mama says, get your coat and let's go. I do as I'm told. Mama throws on her soft blue leather coat, the color of the periwinkle crayon in my Crayola box. And together we slide into her new Riviera as we head back. Are we? Are we headed back to school to confront Miss Miller? Thank God, no. As Mama heads south, away from Winterhalter Elementary, she soon turns onto Second Avenue drives to the corner of Lothrop and parks in front of the new center, build, the new center building. There sits Saks Fifth Avenue. We enter through regal double doors and I instantly fall in love with the store's marble floors, brass elevators, and bright chandeliers. I feel lucky just being here. Mama takes my hand and leads me to the children's shoe department where an array of options spreads before us. She points to a yellow pair of patent leather shoes. Those are pretty, she says. Perhaps the saleswoman looks at us askance, given how rare it must have been to see black people inside Detroit's upscale shops in the 60s, but I don't remember. What I do remember is how nonchalantly Mama opens her wallet, pulls out a $100 bill, and pays for the shoes, while the saleswoman looks at her the way Miss Miller looked at me.
When we get home, Mama says, you're going to wear these to school tomorrow. And you better tell that damn teacher of yours that you actually have a dozen pair of shoes. You hear me? <laughs> the next day, I wear my brand new shoes with a matching yellow knit dress. Nervous, as I walk up to my teacher's desk, I announce, Miss Miller, I have 12 pairs of shoes. She looks down at my feet and then levels those blue eyes at my face. Sit down. Miss Miller never says another word to me. I feel her rejection, but I'm also relieved. I no longer have to worry about what I wear to school or feel bad about my nice things. I feel both protected and indulged by Mama. Growing up, that's how it was for me and my three older sisters and my brother. We lived well, thanks to Mama and her numbers, which inured us from judgment. My mother's message to black and white folks alike was clear. It's nobody's business what I do for my children, nor how I manage to do it. Thank you. Did your mom ever go into some of the uh, the mechanics of uh, of how the operation actually worked, how uh, funds were distributed, and so forth? Just curious. I as actually to how witnessed it works. a lot. I did witness a lot because the business was um, run literally from the dining room table, and so the family knew what she was doing. My older siblings helped her with the business. We saw it going on. I was um, not aware of the intricacies because she didn't insist that I learn them. Her whole thing was, I am doing this so you don't have to. So I never learned it until I decided to write the book. And I went to my Aunt Florence, my mom's remaining sister, her baby sister. This was like nine years ago nine or 10 years ago, I went to her and I said, Aunt Florence, I've been thinking I would like to write this book about my mom and I just wanna know, do I have your permission? How do you feel about me writing this book about Fanny? And she said to me, I was holding my breath. She said, oh, absolutely you should write that book because everybody should know what she did. It was amazing. And I know you don't know a damn thing about the numbers, so I'm gonna help you tell it. And she did, and she did. So research, my Aunt Florence, and figuring it out later, I was able to put all those intricacies in here in the book, but I did not know them growing up. Yeah, it's deep too, it's a, it's a complicated system, which made me appreciate my mom even more. I was like, whoa, that was a lot for her to, to sort of handle. Yeah. yeah. How, how did your mother get involved in the business, only mm -hmm. because I know it can happen by happen, happenstance. I was just telling my friends that yeah. my, during, it wasn't the depression, but during a period of unemployment when in Chester, my father ended up running numbers. Oh, look at that. So yeah. just like, I get that story a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of people. So how like, did your mother make that her livelihood? Right. And what did your father do? Yeah, so basically my parents were part of the Great Migration, that latter end of the Great Migration. Um, both of them grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. My mom's people date back in, to Na in Nashville. Uh, we can trace all the way back to um, File Thompson, who was born a slave. That's how long they had roots in Nashville. And my mom decided to leave those deep roots along with my dad. They were young, in their 20s, but they had three children already because they wanted opportunity. My mom was actually living a pretty comfortable life in Nashville and left that behind because she wanted her children to have the right to go to decent schools. She wanted them, she wanted to be able to vote. People think that history is long ago. It's not, not at all. So like so many blacks, they migrated north. And like so many people, they found the north to be brutal with its own form of uh, racism and discrimination. And my father thought he would get jobs in the auto plants, right? It's Michigan. 
uh, it didn't really work out that way. He would get hired, then he'd get fired. Then he'd get hired again and fired. It was inconsistent work. And my mom just kind of looked up one day and said, something has to happen. By the time they got to Detroit, shortly after they arrived, a year in, they had another child. Now she has four children, and she's 28 years old, and they are experiencing poverty for the first time in their lives. Yeah. And so that's what led my mom to go to her brother's house one day and knock on his door. And as he tells it, she woke him up and everything. And she didn't even take her coat off. She just walked in and said to him, John, I want to try to bank the numbers. I think I can do it. But I need you to loan me $100. Can you loan me $100? And my uncle was a horseman. He worked at the local racetrack. He went on to become one of the first African-American trainers. So he, was, he had steady work. He had a skill. He had the money. Um, he said, I, I listened to her. She explained it all to me. Sounded like it made sense. And I said, OK, Fanny, I'll loan you the money. And that's how she started. It's so funny. It's interesting. Barry Gordy, that same year, borrowed $800 from his family fund to start Motown. It all happened at the same time. Um, so that's really what got her involved. She started slow. She was taking penny bet bets and nickel bets. The, the coins added up. And essentially, this is what it means when you are the bank, when you're the banker, you have to pay out a hit. You guys know what a hit is? You know that the lottery today is really whole cloth, a sort of ripoff of the numbers business that black folks started at the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, I bought lottery tickets today in New York because, hey, it's my publication day. <laughs> I was feeling lucky, so I did. And I'm not kidding. They say numbers. That's what they call it. <laughs> they didn't even change the name when they legalized it. So essentially, um, my mom had to take that $100 and only take enough bets so that if someone did hit, she could pay them out of that little bit of, you know, reserve that she had. Um, but she did it, and the days went by, the weeks went by, the months went, went by, and then her business grew. Yeah, and that's how she did it, and, and gave us a middle-class life. It was pretty awesome. Um, are there any stories of close calls as far as uh, making uh -huh. the hits? so to speak, and... Of, uh, say that again? Of close calls as far as being able to, to make the payoffs and All the time. payouts and, and <laughs> mm -hmm. in any other context as well. Yeah. I can remember... I can remember it was a family activity to raise the money. You know, not to go out and personally raise it, but to help my mom wrap coins so you could take them to the bank and cash them in for dollars. She would, like, raid... She used to collect silver coins in big vessels all through the house. And sometimes things would get so tough, she'd have to empty those, like, you know, containers, and we'd be wrapping those coins. She'd borrow money, you know. She had to really come up with it. Um, because if someone hit, they wanted their money. And my mother's uh, policy was that she paid the next day, no matter what. She paid you by noon the next day. So I saw a few times when it was more famine than feast. Um, but the key was for her to constantly try to replenish her reserve so that she could continue to pay those hits off. What I also saw, well, I didn't see this. I only learned in researching the book um, that the authorities were constantly cracking down on numbers runners, on these uh, numbers operations in the city. And I did not know until I was writing the book that I had this big birthday party when I was 10. It was huge. Like, my whole class was invited. It was a big deal. We had just moved to a new house. I think my mom was trying to really make sure that I felt good about the new neighborhood, that, you know, life would be all right. But it was such a wonderful memory for me. And it was only <laughs> later, when I was doing the research, that I realized two weeks before my birthday party, J. Edgar Hoover <laughs> had ordered a major bust on the numbers business in Detroit and had really, um, they had managed to uh, bust and arrest dozens of people. I think that they claimed that it was, they had clamped down on an $80 million operation. And my mom knew some of those people who were busted. Luckily, she wasn't, 
But what struck me, because it's all about, you know, from my own perspective, was like, wow, through that whole party, I had no idea. She didn't seem nervous. She didn't cancel the party. She wasn't, I, I had no, no idea. And I think that that was the thing that was so beautiful. I don't know how she did it. I always say she was a domestic magician. She had such a sleight of hand because she made us feel that our lives were secure and stable through all that fluctuation. Um, yeah, I found that amazing. I learned that there were a lot of busts that happened during that time. She was just lucky and careful and smart. How did you, how did you write yeah. the book? Did you workshop it? it? Did yeah. you? Yeah. It's a mystery. <laughs> I literally um, applied, I remember I applied for a grant at my university to get a little funding money so I could go and start these interviews in 2009. Yeah. Um, and what was so stunning for me was that that was the first time in my life that I had written those words somewhere, that my mother was a numbers runner in Detroit. You know, you have to write a little proposal. And I was so nervous, I didn't want to hit send. Like I kept letting it sit there and I'm like, oh, the deadline's coming, should I do it? It was terrifying to me. But it was very important because I felt like that was a test run because strangers were going to read that proposal. And I didn't have to worry about them knowing me, um, judging me or my mom. I didn't have to worry if they said, well, who would care about that? I had no idea if anyone would be interested. And thankfully, I got the grant and the reaction was really positive. And that was my first inkling that, you know, maybe people outside my family would care about this story. And that started my journey. So that really started the journey. But the writing process for me was really not writing for the longest. It was collecting interviews. I went back to Detroit and my mom's hometown of Nashville and a few other places where my cousins are, and I re-interviewed people because I found that I learned more when I returned. I knew what to ask. I, people were started to recall more, be more, more comfortable. It's like two dozen interviews that I did ultimately. And I just allowed, allowed, I allowed myself to let that be the writing process for a while. And in between that, I wrote a novel. Yeah, because I was scared to write this story. And so, you know, what do you do when you're scared to write one story? You write a different one. You say, oh, I'm working on a novel that's taking me years. But really, I was also gaining the nerve to write this book. And when I finally, finally sat down to write it, I wrote it relatively quickly. It took me a year. Yeah, well, I've been living with it <laughs> for a while. But um, yeah, I think that for me, that was just how it had to happen. You know, I had to really sort of live in those folks' voices, the people who were talking to me, and really kind of take myself back to that time and place. And then I was able to sit down and write it. I'm really looking forward to reading the book because the content is just fundamentally flat out interesting to me. So <laughs> I, I can't wait to dig in and I'm going to read the book. Um, Great. I have uh, two questions. Uh, an answer to a, a previous question uh, started to hint at, at th this particular question, mm -hmm. which is the big question. And I gather that the book, Numbers is kind of the mechanics for describing an unusually resourceful person, meaning mm -hmm. your mother, that mm -hmm. that, that the book seems to me, from what I'm picking up, principally this homage to this unusually, uh, you know, ahead of the curve, uh, you know, just resourceful is probably the best word, but I think you probably see what I'm getting at. This yeah. was a rather incredible person, uh, the security that she provided, uh, the saving, just the whole package, and, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I would be especially interested to hear you sort of elaborate on that. But like a lot of people here, I can't help but get caught up in some of the technical things mm -hmm. about the numbers because sure. the whole thing is, is kind of fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And there is a technical question I have, and I'm always, I've always been curious if I'm accurate on this one. What I've always understood is that the way the numbers, the daily numbers were derived <laughs> was they would go to the newspaper and they would look at the last three digits of either the attendance at the racetrack 
or the amount of money that was bet. It was like an agate type kind of thing, and that would be the determinant of the number. Am I right on that? Sort of. Okay. <laughs> but I want to hear you talk about your yeah. mom. I'll, I'll answer that technical question like within two minutes, uh, or one, just one minute. Um, so the numbers were founded in Harlem. Uh, the legend has it that it was one man uh, who figured out that the, there were these numbers for something that was called the clearing house, which was a precursor to the stock market figures. These numbers would appear in the daily newspaper and they'd be different every day. And he just realized, huh, I could do something with this. I could really choose those last three digits, which are different every day, and make those the winning numbers. So that was the initial way the numbers were cho chosen. But you're right, eventually cities across the country, and by the way, the Great Migration helped the numbers spread across the country, because black folks took that business model to different cities. Um, and so different cities had their own way to derive at a number. Um, racetrack forms were used based on its place, win, and show of various races that were run. And I describe in one paragraph the, the way it was done. I learned it so I could write it. Can I explain it to you right now? But it's like where the three numbers to the left of the decimal point were used, and then they, the next race you would recalculate based on those numbers and get new numbers. It was a thing. And by the way, my mom knew how to do it. And my aunt, her sister said to me, I never could figure out, I could never figure out how they did that expletive. <laughs> she said, but Fanny could, Fanny could do it. So yeah, that's sort of what, that, that is, the racing forms were used based on the races, the horse races. And, they, and the bosses would pick which racetracks they were gonna use, it would, it would change. You know, sometimes it would be, New Orleans, and then they say, okay, we're gonna use the Florida races. It was something, it was something. My mom, like what I would say is um, about her, I find if there's any interest, and I'm, I've been really fortunate there's been real early interest in this book, and people seem to really connect with my mom's story, and that's so satisfying really is gratifying because I find it so ironic. I knew she was amazing my whole life. I knew that she was unlike any of my friend's mothers. I could see it and my friends adored her. It was like she was more popular than I was. You know, they were always coming over. Is, is Bridget home? No, well, I'll just sit with you, Miss Robinson, and chat with you. She went from Davis to Robinson. Um, so I knew she was different and, and special, and I, I loved that. But it was crazy because I could not brag about her. Like I went my whole life sort of bragging about her, but leaving out the huge thing about her. So it was always a little like, oh, your mom sounds incredible. What does she do for a living? She was in real estate. <laughs> You know, and then it's like amorphous, and then I'm getting into not telling the truth, and I, I, it was so conf so convoluted and complicated. I stopped talking about her, and that was breaking my heart. I loved her, I admired her, I thought she was amazing, and I couldn't talk about her. So for me to be standing here now, telling you all about her, I just find that beautiful. It's ironic, but beautiful, because yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, it means a lot to me because she was all those things. Yeah. If you had to give a message to young people about writing and about interacting with teachers who are not very sensitive and who may have racial bias, what would you tell them? I guess I would think about what my mom taught me, which really was to not look for your self-worth in the gaze of someone else. And I do think she was a little angry, uh, of course, at what Miss Miller had done to this six-year-old, but also upset that I had taken it in and taken it personally. I feel as though that's what the whole trip to the store was about. No, we're not gonna change course here because someone else has an issue with you. That's not your problem, that's theirs. And so that's what I try to teach my children and that's what I try to move forward and, uh, in the world with myself. It's not always easy. 
I just think some people like my mom are hardwired to, to know how to navigate the world, you know? Um, but, but I do think that we can learn those tools. And so that's my, that's my suggestion, you know, that we remember that. Um, she loved to tell, I mean, this isn't unique. People have said this, but she liked to say it a lot. She'd say, you're better than no one, but you're as good as anyone. You know, and so you grow up hearing that you start, you, it helps, <laughs> you know, it really helps. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, I came about your book and your work through my best friend, Cleaver Cruz, who has emailed you and works with the, uh, the publishing house. So yes. I had to be here, but he, I'm so struck by this because like, and you, and I haven't even read the text, but literally he was walking me through the entire text <laughs> before it's out, <laughs> thankfully. But in you telling this is like also telling a story about my life because I grew up with my grandmother and great grandmother, dream books around people calling. They're like, "What's the lead?" Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was that was like literally What's my the life. Lead? Oh, you you really know about that world. Like, I grew up in this. But I think what I'm most interested in about because I see the ways like numbers for Black people are like connected deeply to spirituality. Mm -hmm. And like my great grandmother was a very very deeply religious woman, mm -hmm. and would rely upon like whatever's happening in life. Right, and, and understanding also like these numbers, like I'm gonna play this number because somebody's pregnant, fish gives this, mm -hmm. this is gonna come out mm -hmm. on the street, and this is, can help me pay my bills. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I wonder yeah. if you've thought deeply about like oh, how- Oh, absolutely. I have a like, whole- Like the spiritual yeah, implications absolutely. of all of this, you know what I mean? Even though like it wasn't necessarily talked about in the church, you know what I mean? But like, well, it you know, it's like, was. it's very like interesting and complex, <laughs> but like, it's complex. It's you know a great question. I mean, but it's question. beautiful, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And I'll just, a, a quick answer. Because um, I do devote a whole chapter to that whole issue of the whole sort of spiritual connection to numbers and what dreams mean. I mean, basically, dreams have power and meaning in black culture that is deeper than, you know, what you've heard people talk about before, like interpreting their dreams, I do think it harks back to Africa and this idea of the power of dreams and what they mean. And black folks really have felt when it comes to numbers that there's magic in them, that the spirit world, your ancestors can be talking to you, giving you messages, giving you a gift through the numbers. Like if you dream a number, and, you know, meaning you don't really dream the number. You dream something. You dream a noun. You dream a play, about a place, a person, a thing. And then you go to the Bible of the numbers business, the dream book. And there are three-digit numbers assigned to anything you could imagine. I mean anything. You know, like seeing a black cat. That plays for 527, you know. I mean, it's really crazy. Fish is a very powerful Thing to dream. There are numbers associated with that in the different dream books. So people believe that, hey, you know, this is some, someone in my ancestral world that is helping me, reaching back to help me, right? And, uh, and so n playing the numbers took on a meaning that was beyond just this idea that you're gambling. You know, like no one in my house ever even used that word. It wasn't like that. It was a communal kind of ritual. And I will just say very quickly, you know, for instance, um, the dream book that we used in our house a lot was called The Three Wise Men. That was like my mom's favorite dream book. I was so fortunate, thanks to her life and numbers, to have inherited generational wealth. Thanks to property she bought by running the numbers, I was able to sell that property, um, take the proceeds, and buy a home in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I have a lovely brownstone in bed -Stuy. I'm so thrilled. It's like my Brooklynite American dream. Um, and the address is 675. Yeah. The Three Wise Men Dream Book, ask me what plays for 675. Fanny. Fanny, my girlfriend said she's taking care of you from beyond. Yeah, so I 
believe in the power of numbers. They have definitely had influence in my life, so yeah. This is really basic, but I just wanna know how many people in here grew up with a dream book in the house? How or many people had in a relative? here drew, yes. drew, grew up with a dream book in the house or someone they knew had a dream book in the house? Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who doesn't know what a dream book is? Yeah, you can still buy them. Yeah, they're in bodegas, you know? They're at magazine stands in Harlem. You can still buy a dream book. It's a, it's a fascinating little booklet. I recommend you pick up one, thumb through it. Thank you guys. You've been great, thank you.